All right, guys, it is take two. We are uh, hopefully not going to have so much technical difficulties this time. So everybody, welcome to the osteosarcoma live Q&A take two. So we had some um, difficulties with my technical stuff. I'm not sure if it's because there's a crazy lightning and thunderstorm going on outside my house right now, but hopefully I'm going to be able to see your comments, which was the big problem. So I know that my friend, oh, I'm seeing comments, yay! Hey Robin, I'm seeing Andrew from Egypt. Uh, awesome to have you guys here. So um, real quick, just because if people watch this later, I want them to know all the information and then we'll dive into bone cancer and dogs. Next live Q&A is Wednesday, June 20th at 9 p.m. Oh, look, at I see all the comments. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being so patient with me. So next um, Q&A, Wednesday, June 20th at 9 p.m., and we will be doing cat skin tumors, including injection site sarcomas, uh, which are also called vaccine-associated sarcomas. Hey, D. And... The other thing that I wanted to remind you guys is that we are taking all the information. So what I consider like the key points with the different tumors, obviously this month we're doing osteosarcoma and there'll be graphics that we're going to be posting on Facebook every couple of days. Um, probably one every other day. The first one just went up right before this video went on and every couple of days they'll come out with a with one of my key important you know, pieces of information about bone cancer and then once they're all done you can go back into the photo section in Facebook and look at them all in a nice album and we've done this this is our fourth tumor so far this year in January we did dog osteosarcoma then we did cat oste dog lymphoma cat osteosarcoma of the brain. Then we did cat lymphoma, and then we spent March and April talking about mast cell tumors. And so for each of those, there's an album with all of the key information, and there's also all the Q&As. And you can find those, the easiest place to find them is on my YouTube channel in the Q&A section. You know, there's also my blogs and things like that there as well. So I would love, love, love guys if you um, hop onto my YouTube channel at some point and subscribe to my channel as well. But again, this is for me to help you guys about bone cancer. And this is a tumor that I really want to dive into and there's a lot to go through. I got some good questions. Oh good, I'm glad the audio has improved, Lynn. Thank you again for your patience. I hate technical stuff and I'm not good at it. And Caitlin DeWild, Dr. DeWild is my friend and colleague and she helps me with my social media and is very patient with me. So thank you, Caitlin, for making sure that we're getting set up properly. So let's talk a little bit about bone cancer. I'm gonna kind of give you a five minute overview and then we'll talk about questions. And so, you know, let's see, we have Leah from South Florida. And you know, what I'd love to know is our, if, if you're joining, does your pet, have osteosarcoma bone cancer? Are you going through this right now? Is this something maybe that you went through before? You know, and that is really helpful as we can, I wanna make sure that we can tailor this for you. So we just threw a link to the YouTube channel. Again, you'll find this Q and A there probably tomorrow and all of our different Q and A's there as well. Last year we did some general ones, which kind of were a mishmash of different tumors, which are were good, but again, I want them to be focused so you can use these as reference. All right, so let's talk about bone cancer. Hey Bruce, hey Brad. Let's talk about bone cancer. First off guys, it is a very treatable cancer and we have a lot of statistics about it, which is good. So we know a lot about it. It is, so bone cancer, osteosarcoma is the most common bone cancer that we see in dogs. We tend to see it in large and giant breed dogs. But as you saw, if you watched my video that I posted from work today, when I was reminding everybody about this, we can see it in small dogs as well. So I have little Roxy, uh, she's a schnoodle. She's not the poster child for osteosarcoma, but we can see it in small breed dogs as well but it tends to be a cancer of large and giant breed dogs. And so we see it in Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, Greyhounds, Rottweilers, Golden Retrievers. Um, but again, usually it's the height of the dog, St. Bernard's that we see the cancer in. And again, the majority of dogs that have bone cancer, because there are some other kinds, will have osteosarcoma. The way that I think that we need to think about osteosarcoma, guys, is there are two battlefronts. The first battlefront is where the tumor is growing. So where do these tumors tend to grow? We say towards the knee and away from the elbow. So shoulder, wrist, which is the distal radius in dogs, and then towards the knee. So the bottom of the femur bone, the top of the tibia bone, I'm pointing to my knee like you guys are going to see it, but the bone's right there. And then also I'm wearing my slippers. 
and my cute polka dot socks. And um, one of the sort of bonus locations, I can't believe I'm doing this, is um, at the at the top of the ankle bone, so the bottom of the tibia bone. So again, shoulder, wrist, top of the thigh bone, um, just the bone just below the knee, and also at the hock or the ankle as well. Those are the most common locations that we see osteosarcoma. Guys, if you have a large and giant breed dog, so one of these dogs at risk, and they are lame and have swelling at one of these high-risk areas, I'm really proactive with these. I think you should go to your vet and get x-rays of that area. I don't think these are ones that you should go home, hey, Jim, and you can do pain meds, but to be honest, they're going to get a little bit better on pain meds. And so, again, not every dog that is lame needs to have x-rays, but again, if you have one of these large and giant breed dogs in the, in the high-risk areas, this tends to be a cancer of middle-aged and older dogs, get x-rays, get them at that visit. We're still going to send you home on pain meds, but I think we really need to be very proactive with x-rays. And if you have a big fluffy St. Bernard or Golden Retriever and it's a shoulder, sometimes hard to really see that swelling because there's so much hair. When you have a greyhound, you know, these smooth coated dogs, you may see that a little bit more obviously. But again, we want to be really proactive. So what does a tumor do? It causes a lot of bone destruction um, at the area and kind of eats away at the bone and it can also lay down abnormal bone as well. So again, it's painful. It causes a lot of destruction and the dogs are at risk for fracture. The fracture rate's pretty low, only about three to 5% of dogs will have a fracture, what we call pathologic fracture, which is from the tumor, you know, making the bone weak. Second battlefront, guys, and this is what dogs that, after they go through surgery, will usually succumb to the cancer metastasizing. And the most common place that it spreads is the lungs. Second most common location is other bones. And we know by the time we find this cancer, most dogs will have micro spread, little baby osteosarcoma cells in their lungs that we can't pick up on their chest x-rays. So again, we have to think of two battlefronts. Is the tumor where the tumor is growing, say at the shoulder, and then chemotherapy to prevent the cancer from spreading. And we'll talk about the osteosarcoma. All right, so that's sort of the overview. Real quick, how do we treat this? You can be palliative, comfort. So no aggressive treatment, just palliative. You can do surgery or local disease control. In general, the most common way is surgery. Radiation would be an alternative option or a limb spare surgery. In general, surgery alone, four to five months. So because you're just removing the source of pain, but again, we're, they're gonna usually end up to the cancer spreading. So that's gonna be the other big issue. With a combination of local disease, whether it's ideal, usually surgery or radiation plus chemotherapy, the average survival time is about a year. I know it doesn't sound long, but again, longer than with just amputation alone. And I try to remember, you know, to remind pet owners, including myself when my own pets are sick, that a year is a long time in a dog's life, especially, unfortunately, large and giant breed dogs have shorter lifespans. So a year is, is not too bad. And again, it's a great quality of life. They do really well as, as tripods, as we say it. Caitlin, three, please throw up the tripod site. If you guys don't know about this, this is a great community of pet owners that have three-legged dogs and cats, um, and that they just they blog about it, and it's just a really, really great site. So again, surgery alone, about five months. Combination of surgery and chemotherapy is going to be about a year. 25% of the dogs are alive at two years, and about 10 to 15% of the dogs are alive at three years. And I have exceptions to the rule. One of my favorite greyhounds, great uh, Seamus, who I talk about in my lecture, lived over four years. And 23 months after his first tumor, he developed a second tumor in a rib. We did more surgery and more chemo. So there are definitely some long-term survivors out there. But again, this is a tumor that's treatable. But again, let's get early diagnosis. So get those x-rays, especially remember, high-risk breed, pain and swelling at a high-risk area. Let's get some x-rays. All right, guys, that is my spiel. I know it was a lot of information, but I wanted to give it to you. You can come back and listen to it again, but I really want you to have the overview um, so you can come back and hopefully that will help you as we go through. Okay, so we have some questions. I'm really excited that you guys are here. Let's see. I think uh, lots of great questions. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I'm going to answer, um, we, I got a question, actually it was a, to my closed Facebook messaging thing about the osteosarcoma vaccine. So we will talk about that as well. So one question that I got was, 
what is the best drug for sarcoma? So this was from Jesse, and I'm assuming that we're talking about osteosarcoma and not just sarcomas in general, but since that's what we're talking about, that's what I'm gonna answer. So the two main drugs that have been used for chemotherapy for osteosarcoma have been doxorubicin and carboplatin. And things have been, you know, changed. At one point, doxorubicin was the standard drug, and then carboplatin was. There was a time where we were alternating both. There was a great study that came out of Colorado State, which is a fabulous cancer center, and they looked at, I want to say, almost 500 dogs, and statistically, survival time-wise, they didn't see much of a difference between carboplatin and doxorubicin. So based on this information and that carbo doesn't have the heart side effects, a lot of oncologists, including myself, will do single agent carboplatin, usually for six doses, um, usually starting about a week after the, uh, sorry, two weeks after surgery. And we'll do that every three weeks, um, again, for a total of six dosages. I will save doxorubicin. I have used it in some cases where there's been progression. Um, but again, at this point in general, I start with carboplatin as my main drug. It's uh, one of the other drugs that has historically been used is cisplatin, which is a relative of carbo. They're in the same family. One of the big differences with cisplatin is it can cause kidney toxicity and requires a long administration where they're getting fluids before and after to diurese or flush out the kidneys to prevent toxicity to the kidneys. Carboplatin is a relative of it and it doesn't have that kidney toxicity, so you don't have to do the fluids before and after. So logistically, it's just easier for the pet and the clinic so they don't have these dogs that are getting high rates of fluid and peeing out chemotherapy all over the clinic. So ideally, they would be in a secluded run for that. So again, carboplatin is going to be the chemotherapy of choice that uh, most oncologists are using. So let's see what comments we're getting. Um, so about golden paste during chemo radiation, I've heard it's not. So I actually don't know, Cheryl, about golden paste um, and what that is. Uh, artemisin, yes, we'll talk about supplements. I'm going to try to get through some of the chemo questions, and we will definitely talk about some of the supplements as well. Um, Renata text just says vets need to be emotional medical ankle for these clients who are often grasping at stores for reassurance. Yes, I, I agree. So I'm going to try to scroll through because as we get lots of questions and discussion, which I love, um, sometimes it's hard to me to find those. So Kelly says, my great Dane had osteosarcoma in his shoulder. We were shocked when after 18 months of going strong, it spread to his spine. So it is shocking. And Kelly, unfortunately, like I mentioned, um, after spreading to the um, lungs, other bone is the second most common location. With Seamus, the Great Dane that I was mentioning, who had a lesion in his rib 23 months, so just short of two years after, we had done a CT scan and didn't see any spread elsewhere in his lungs or the rest of him, and that's why we weren't sure if it was actually a new primary tumor. When we went and actually did his surgery, it was read out as a low grade, which was a different biopsy than his first one. So we actually think he just developed two primary osteosarcomas. But yeah, it is shocking when it spreads 18 months. It's never long enough. I totally, totally get it. Um, but 18 months is, you know, longer than the statistics. So it, it's, a, it's good. But again, it hurts when it's your own for sure. So I'm really sorry, Kelly, that you went through that. Uh, Sue said mine had a fracture, which is why I helped her cross that day. So Sue, I'm really sorry about that. So yeah, the, the reported incidence of a fracture from the cancer is about 3%. It's actually not a negative predictor. What do I mean by that? If you look at dogs that come in with a pathologic fracture, they do not do worse than if it, they just come in without that fracture. The problem is it's super devastating. And I know Sue went through this, right? Because you're forced to make a very quick decision about what you want to do. And I think this might be a good time before we talk about some of the other therapies and supplements to talk about amputation. And I would love to, you know, if people in the comments would tell me if, you know, who's has their dog gone through an amputation and if so, Overall, were you pleased with your dog's quality of life? And the reason I'm asking that in, in that question is amputation is one of the hardest things that I see pet owners struggle to go through. And afterwards, they're so pleased with their pet's quality of life, but it is so hard to imagine because 
let's be honest, guys, we as veterinarians are asking pet owners to remove a dog's leg. I'm really comfortable recommending it because I know how well dogs can do it and other veterinarians can chime on and, and probably agree with that, right? So uh, actually Roxy, the dog who didn't want to walk in my clinic today on the Slippery Forest, mom had just sent us a video, which I'm going to post hopefully tomorrow, of Roxy playing in the backyard, playing ball, running around. I've seen dogs still swim and, and sheep herd and do all these things as three-legged dogs, but it's a very difficult decision to go through. There was a study that showed that like 86% of pet owners were satisfied with their pet's quality of life and something like 80% of the pet owners actually thought that their pet adapted better than they anticipated. So, and we also know that dogs that are not overweight tend to do better as amputees as well, but I've had some overweight dogs also do well. Um, all dogs and cats. Yeah, so Jim, one of my fellow colleagues and uh, Uncharted members said, yep, all dogs and cats are born with a spare leg. And so it's true, they can do really, really well, but I don't want to minimize how difficult it is to make that decision as an amputation. And that is why I love the tripod site or any other community that you can find. You know, go to YouTube and Google three or put in the search bar three-legged dogs and they you'll see how well they can do. Um, I want to say in my video, I don't remember what vlog number it was, but it's one with Fallon, uh, one of my current patients right now, and she's running through the snow of the backyard with Maggie, uh, you know, just doing so great as a three-legged dog. So they do really well, but it is really, really hard. Uh, Caitlin says, I tell clients that God made dogs with uh, three legs and a spare. So absolutely, same thing that Jim is telling us. So again, we as veterinarians, um, absolutely know this, but again, it's hard, it's shocking. And so if you're thinking about making that decision as a pet owner, uh, you know, I think it's reassuring to know that most other pet owners were super happy with it. But again, it's not an easy thing to do. The other thing is even if you just do surgery and don't do chemotherapy and other things like that, it is the best way to address your dog's pain because they don't need pain medications afterwards and they can do really, really well. So, you know, if owners say to me, I don't want to do chemotherapy, should I still do the amputation? I, in general, say yes. If you have any questions about whether your dog's going to be a good candidate, so Fallon's mom is here. So um, Fallon's mom, if you remember what video, um, what vlog she was in running around in the snow at the end with Maggie, um, so we can do that. So Tripods is also um, posting a link to Fallon's um, blog uh, about her whole experience. So that would be a great thing. So Dawn, her mom, has been fabulous about sharing her journey. But again, they do really, really well, but it is very, very hard to make that decision. So Kelly says, we did CyberKnife and Pimidronate um, for nine months, plus Carbo, four rounds for my dame with osteosarcoma on the front shoulder, and then the pathologic fracture, and they amputated. He bounced back really quick for us and had 18 months. We're very blessed. And Kelly, thank you for sharing your story. I know it's not easy. Hey, Kelly, I'm just curious, where did you do radiation? Because this would be a good time to talk about radiation. So... Um, so in general, we, I keep talking about amputation and surgery is the, is the standard of care, you know, the main way that we usually deal with the leg that has the osteosarcoma in it. But there are alternatives, and we call them limb spares. So you're trying to spare the limb. A lot of this was pioneered at Colorado State, which again, which is one of the top cancer centers. And one of the things they can do if it's of the, um, the end of the radius bone just above the wrist or the carpus in dogs um, oh, Hope and Malvern. I love that. So that's the Veterinary Cyberknife Cancer Center. Fabulous place. Dr. Haney is fabulous there. So one of the things they did at Colorado is a bone transplant where, and really it has to be the radius is the best location, so the end of the front leg, where they take off the affected bone and they actually put in a bone from a dog that has passed um, and they plate that in and basically they plate all the way down across um, the wrist into the fingers or the metacarpal region in dogs. And so that was one of the first ways that we were learning how to do limb spares. Now we have great things like um, stereotactic radiation and cyber knife is one of those. The practice that I was at from... 2009, for about eight years, we were one of the first CyberKnife facilities. We were the first CyberKnife facility. And with Colorado, we were the first two places doing stereotactic radiation. And basically, that's where you just give a very focal dose of high-dose radiation to kill the cancer cells 
to spare the leg. The sort of fine print with that is there can't be that much bone destruction. So if we had a case that we did a CT scan and saw a lot of bone destruction that we thought that the leg was likely to fracture because we were going to kill the cancer cells, but there wasn't enough bone there, they may not be candidates. It is about, still about a 30% fracture rate, and in general, stereotactic radiation is about twice the cost of amputation. So I have had cases just like Kelly's dog where we did CyberKnife, we did that stereotactic radiation, and then they fractured. And I had one very memorable case. Um, one was at seven months and one was at nine. And I'll be honest, these were owners that would not amputate in the beginning. And I really thought that when I went in the room and told them that their dog fractured, that we were you know, going to have to make that difficult decision. And I have two very memorable cases where the owners did go ahead and amputate. They felt that they had tried and they could see how well the dog was doing and we were that far into chemo and the dog had not spread. So never take amputation off the table, guys, because I know that there are a lot of pet owners who told me they wouldn't and then did and then were happy. So I feel really passionate that it's something that we need to talk about and that, you know, amputation is really, really scary, but it can be the right option. So again, stereotactic radiation would be a good alternative in some dogs um, if there's not a lot of bone destruction as an alternative to amputation. The other type of radiation is palliative or comfort-driven radiation, and that is another good option if amputation's not an option, either due to medical orthopedic issues or owner preference. And that is where you're giving a, a, a different dose of radiation, not quite as high, and it's really meant to cause more comfort and pain control. And we know that that can release endorphins, those happy hormones, and also sometimes do some scar down and stabilize the area as well. So palliative, and it's also a heck of a lot cheaper than the stereotactic radiation and an amputation. So that's another good option, guys, if you're against doing amputation or stereotactic. And again, you know, cost always comes into play as well. So Kate says, Thank, uh, so glad you're covering this topic. My dog Rocco, Oh, died of osteosarcoma eight weeks ago. So Kate, I'm really sorry. That sounds way too soon, right? That's very raw. So it was diagnosed on Halloween, um, right on the right hind knee. She amputated uh, a day later. And Carbo, he did great for two weeks until Christmas. Um, four weeks. So it's a lot to read here. So two things I would like you to speak about. So I'm kind of scrolling through. So TPLO surgery, Rocky's, uh, Rocco's cancer developed right where his TPLO surgery. Great question. I do want to talk about that. Um, and my dog has had two TPLOs, one on each side. So we should talk about that um, and that they should have regular x-rays and caught it earlier and make sure all the rescue and herder dogs are tested for the mutation. So yes, good questions. So um, Kate's first point is the association between implants so what's an implant? Some sort of metal device. So usually we're doing these now and sometimes in young dogs like my Matilda um, for, you know, cruciate repairs. So Matilda had a TPLO done uh, when she was four and then she just had one done on her on the other leg on her right leg on Valentine's Day. There are a couple of papers that show an association in dogs that have had implants and the development of osteosarcoma. In the paper that I can remember, remember offhand, there were 16 tumors diagnosed and 13 out of the 16 were osteosarcoma. There were a few other cancers of bone as well. What we don't know is it the, the something carcinogenic about the plate itself. Is it that they're, you know, Sometimes we know extra inflammation. We know this is an issue with cats and their injection site sarcomas. Extra inflammation can cause mutations, and that can be it. Is there something about the disturbed healing or some sort of trauma from the initial injury as well? So we don't know what it is, but I agree that we're starting to see it, and I think it's really important if your dog has an implant that you monitor it regularly. So I'm a big proponent that middle-aged and older dogs should have chest x-rays and ultrasounds twice a year. And I think it wouldn't be wrong to include the area where that plate is and include that in your, when you're bringing your dog in for chest x-rays. So I think it's a great point. I would love for us to know the incidents. We don't really know how often it's happened, but like I said, there's a couple of, um, papers out there. I treated a fabulous dog when I was at my Hudson Valley practice, Mangus. If any of my team members are here, they'll remember him. And he had 
two T TPLOs and was lame, went back to the orthopedic surgeon. They just thought maybe something was wrong with the plate. Maybe the screws had migrated and he developed osteosarcoma. And he actually did not do as well as the statistics and actually metastasized in the middle of his carbo protocol. And he was one of the dogs that we changed over to doxorubicin. So, um, it's scary guys. And I'll admit it. I'm in the same camp. I have a dog that has plates in both of her back legs. So Kate, I'm sorry that I went through that, but I really appreciate your sharing a story and reminding me to talk about that because I think it's good information. She says, we were also against amputation in the beginning, but we, but glad we went through the whole journey. We learned so much through our doctors and some of the groups and our own research. So thank you, Kate, for sharing your journey. I know it's not easy. And if you just lost your dog eight weeks ago, I know that the hole in your heart is very, very big and raw. So um, I know everyone here is sending you their sympathy. You had another good point that I wanted to um, just mention, make sure rescue and herding dogs are tested. So she mentions the uh, MDR mutation. So this is a mutation and certain breeds are higher risk than others. Uh, that one of the high risk breeds are collies. Uh, another one are Australian shepherds, but they can have a mutation that makes them more sensitive to some drugs like ivermectin, which is one of the heart guard medications or heartworm medications, and also some chemotherapy. So it doesn't affect carboplatin, which like I said, is the main drug that I'm using for osteosarcoma, but it is one that you would have to lower the dose if they were mutants which always makes me think of superheroes, maybe because of my husband and my boys. But if they're mutants, they can be a double mutant or just half mutant. You have to adjust their chemotherapy. So doxorubicin is definitely affected by that. So a great source to find out if your dog is on that list is Washington State University. Just Google them an MDR mutation and it'll have a full list I, I, for some reason, I remember German Shepherds are 10%, but there's a nice list there of the different breeds that are um, at risk for that. But again, carboplatin, the main drug that we use for osteosarcoma, whether or not they have the mutation is not as important. But again, just really good information, especially if you have one of these breeds in general, just to have it and it doesn't hurt to have them tested anyway, because your dog could have part of that. They don't have to be a pure breed to have that. So uh, Kate, thank you, fabulous, fabulous information. Uh, Alexis asked to get diagnosed based just on x-ray. The information is so vague and based on st statistics, such an easy feeling. Um, and then Sue says, Dr. Sue, how often do you see osteosarcoma as a secondary cancer? This just happened. So I'm not sure what you mean by a secondary cancer. So unfortunately, I mean, I have dogs that get two cancers um, over the course of their life. And I think the better we are controlling one cancer, they may live long enough to see another. So Seamus, I keep mentioning that greyhound and a, um, developed a soft tissue sarcoma on the body wall, um, sort of just behind where the, the left leg was amputated that we diagnosed a couple of months while he was in the middle of his chemo a couple of months after amputation. So we can see dogs that have two tumors Bruno, another memorable case of mine, he was a dog that had multiple mast cell tumors, and I'm sure I talked about him in one of the two Q&As Q last time. And his first mast cell tumor, he had about one a year. They were always the less aggressive ones. His first one, I want to say, was about 2009. Um, I want to say five or six, seven years after that, he developed osteosarcoma, and we went through amputation with him, and he lived two years and four months. And he also developed another soft tissue sarcoma, another skin tumor um, as well. So we do have dogs that have multiple tumors. Uh, usually, again, it means that we're probably doing a good job controlling the first tumor. But I don't know if I can answer the question of how often I see it as a secondary tumor. One of the times that you can definitely see it as a secondary tumor is we know that radiation is one of the causes of osteosarcoma. So if a dog had an incompletely resected skin tumor, like a mast cell tumor, or a soft tissue sarcoma and they couldn't get margins maybe because it was over their leg and we didn't have enough skin to remove. So we know that one of the great ways to prevent those two cancers from growing back is radiation. And we know that three to five years after that radiation, there's about a three to 5% incidence that they'll have bone cancer because the bone was under that area and was, was radiated. So that would be a type of time where we would see osteosarcoma as a secondary tumor 
uh, secondary to radiation. But again, three to five years after the first tumor and a three to 5% incidence. So again, pretty low, um, you know, in terms of how often we are seeing that. So Alexis asked, and this is a great question to get diagnosed. Um, how do we do that? So great question. So if I have a dog that is a high risk dog, so based on breed and based on location and based on x-ray appearance, and there's four different things that we doctors and radiologists will look at on x-rays. In my opinion, it's osteosarcoma till proven otherwise. Again, the high risk air or ages, it's usually middle-aged and older dogs. And for these large breed dogs, it's usually about five to seven years old. We also see a second peak period of 18 months to two-year-old dogs. So, and that's why this cancer has been studied as a translational cancer for pediatric osteosarcoma. So again, if you have a dog, high risk location, a high risk breed, and the radiographic appearances, there's not many other things um, that can cause that. One of the other things is fungal disease. And so that's where you're gonna to talk to your veterinarian. We don't have a lot of fungal disease that affects the bone in the Northeast area. So I don't usually have to worry about it. A couple of years ago, I had a dog that was just um, adopted from California, from the sort of Arizona, California area. And that is an area. So we did some extra testing before we did amputation. So to answer your question, and I don't remember, Sue. Nope, I can't remember who. Um, Alexis might have asked the question. So in general, if I have those things, I'm happy to go ahead and do the amputation, and then we will submit the leg at the time and confirm the diagnosis, because again, of all of those risk factors. If it's in an area, a different bone, or a, a, a dog like Roxy, where it's a low risk, you know, it's not as high risk, that might be a dog I'm gonna do some extra diagnostics before we go to amputation. So if it's in the middle of the bone, that's not a common location. That's more likely gonna be spread of another cancer. I'm not gonna amputate that dog's leg without knowing what's going on and making sure that there isn't another cancer internally that's spread to that bone because it's in the middle of the bone and not at the end, if that makes sense. So how do we do a diagnosis? Historically, we used to do bone biopsies, but they are associated with fractures. So in general, I will start with a bone aspirate. We will still, still do the sedated because it's painful to stick a needle in a bone. Um, and often we'll do, if we can do some imaging, so ultrasound guided or ideally C, uh, fluoro, which is like a live CT to make sure that you're in the affected area. Aspirate some of those cells send them out to the lab under the microscope and they can do a special stain, an alkaline phosphatase stain. And if you get the cytology that stains for that, there's a 90% certainty that it's bone cancer. So talk to your veterinarian, talk to your oncologist about whether or not your dog needs cytology. Again, I have some owners that are not gonna do an amputation until I confirm the diagnosis, that's fine. But again, in general, high risk breed, classic location, classic age, Classic x-ray appearance, osteosarcoma till proven otherwise, and I'm gonna tell the owners the pros and the cons of doing an aspirate or a biopsy or just going ahead and doing surgery. If we're gonna to go to radiation and we're not gonna submit, we're not gonna get sample, I'm gonna definitely wanna get a diagnosis before we go ahead and do radiation. So hopefully that's helpful. My good friend, Bruce, doctor, Dr. Bruce, what do you have to say? Sometimes, something I always tell my clients is that medicine is all about risk versus reward. It's a calculated gamble and we just try to stack the deck in our favor. And I absolutely agree. But again, I'm never gonna deny an owner an aspirate if they really wanna know or if it's gonna change what we're gonna do. And you know me, or maybe you don't know me yet, I love aspirates, right? You know, for skin and subcutaneous tumors, we're not taking them off till we know what it is. But again, for these internal tumors, there are risks, you know, amputation, I'm sorry, there are risks to biopsy like fracture and things like that. So I am gonna either do cytology or again, maybe just go straight to surgery. So great advice, Bruce. Um, Patricia, my Bernese Mountain Dog had a TPL surgery back in July of 2015, so almost three years ago. Uh, this involved the left hind leg. She was seven and a half at the time. In November of 2017, x-ray showed a lytic lesion in the fibula exactly adjacent to the plate and the bolts. And it came back chondrosarcoma. They amputated final pathology, showed stage one. So that is probably grade one, so less aggressive, and she's being monitored, so chemo was not recommended. So yeah, so, and this is why you need to submit that leg when you take it off, right? So we can say, you know, I said 85 to 90% of dogs with bone cancers are osteosarcoma. But there are a few other types. Chondrosarcoma, which is what Patricia's dog had, which is a cartilage-based tumor. 
There are blood vessel ones, so hemangiosarcoma, that can be in the bone as well. Um, you can sometimes get histiocytic sarcoma, which is a cancer that we see high risk in burners. And the other one is a fibrosarcoma, which is a connective tissue. So those are the primary cancers that you're going to see in bone. And that's why you're never just going to not submit it because some of these other tumors like the cartilage based one and the low grade ones, we may not recommend chemo afterwards. So that's really important information. And so for Patricia's dog, they're just monitoring probably with chest x-rays um, every three months, which is great information. So why wait? Aspirate. Absolutely, Bruce. Bruce? You get a bonus. I'm going to send you something. Um, Bruce, send me your address. I, you know, anybody who is a big fan of why wait aspirate and early cancer detection, because, you know, early cancer detection, guys, is when I feel like we have the most power to make the most impact on our patients. And that just makes me um, really, really happy if they can live longer and live well. So guys, I love all the questions. I'm trying to roll through, scroll through. Sheila says, my greyhound. I love greyhounds, guys. They are such good dogs. Fallon's mom, Dawn, if you're still here, you know how I feel about Fallon. Seamus, oh, the other greyhound I keep measuring. So um, I've never had a greyhound, but I love every greyhound I met. So anyway, Lucy had osteosarcoma. She survived amputation, her right hind leg, and chemo survived 32 months. I love it. I'm so sorry she passed away in June of 2014. Breakthroughs um, since then give hope to others. So it is true. So before we wrap up, and I'm going to go a little bit longer, I do want to say goodnight to my boys before they go to bed. But since I had some technical difficulties, um, we will go a little bit longer if you guys are up for that. Is that good? <laughs> Bruce, what are you laughing about that you're getting stuff? If you guys want me to stick around for a few more minutes, I would love to talk about the, oh, and Alexis, I see your question um, about the osteosarcoma vaccine, because this is a cool breakthrough that I'm super, super excited about. And Caitlin, I feel like we're going to have to do a part two, right? Because we didn't even get to supplements and there's so many things to talk about with osteosarcoma. So two questions. You guys want me to stay on for a few more minutes? I see some hearts and thumbs up. That's great. And then again, are we going to have to do part two? I think we might have to do part two on this because I don't want to not answer all your questions on this because this is a really important topic. And I know I spent some time talking about amputation, but that I want. Um, Valerie's joining late. Totally acceptable. Valerie can always go back and watch from the start. Um, will you be doing live Q&A? Yes. So the plan was for June 20th to be doing skin cancers in cats. And then I think we're doing skin cancers in dogs. Yes, part two for sure, says Jen. Um, I hear my dogs coming up the stairs, which means the cat, the kids, the kids are coming up too. I hope they do not invade. So June 20th, we're doing skin tumors. We were going to do, I don't know, Caitlin, I can't remember the schedule. I think skin masses and dogs after that, uh, we will get it posted. So it will be in the events page as well. So we'll have them all there. And yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at the schedule, but this is why I can't do this all by myself. So we will do a part two because again, I feel really strongly about this. This is a cancer that I like to talk about. But before we wrap it up tonight, talk about Artemis and, and vaccination, stay on. Kate, I got kids, I got my boys, I gotta say goodnight to them soon, but I'm gonna try, and again, we can do part two. And then I think it was Valerie who came on late. You can always go back and watch these, you can watch the replay on Facebook, and they will be posted on YouTube, hopefully by tomorrow, if I can get my act together and get them posted there. So, like I said, um, I'm happy to do part two. Uh, tripods, thank you so much. I'm trying to do it as well as I can. Artemisin is a cool supplement. We can come back and talk about supplements in part two, but that is a cool one that is thought to have some anti-cancer properties. And again, we'll go into that in more, a little bit more time. So great information. Yay. Great G-R-E-Y-T. Great information. Okay. So yes, Caitlin's telling me that we're doing skin masses in dogs in July and June. It's only May, right? And June, we're going to do skin masses in cats. And we're going to have to look at my calendar. I'm doing a little bit of traveling. I'm speaking in Chicago and then in Orlando and then in Seattle. So I have to figure out when we're going to get it in, but we'll get it in. Okay. Osteosarcoma vaccine. What is going on with this? So this is something that's been studied by Dr. Nicola Mason at Penn. Uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, and this is a uh, Listeria vaccine that has a HER2 new target. I know, I already lost most of you guys, right? So 
Um, they're using listeria as our vector. So listeria sounds scary, right? Because listeria is a bacteria that can make us sick if it's in our hummus and on our vegetables. But they've modified it, so it's not going to make the dog sick. But they're using that to bring this HER2 new, which is overexpressed. It's a mutation that's overexpressed in a good number of dogs and people, both in their primary and spread lesions. So it should work for both locations. Um, and it, the listeria and the HER2 new work together to, as an immunotherapy to help the immune system kill the cancer cells. So this is now in clinical trials, and there are about 20, maybe 22 locations that have the, that veterinary cancer center where I am in Norwalk, Connecticut. Caitlin, if we can throw the link, is one of those. And there are criteria to be included. And basically, they have to have had an amputation. They had to have um, chemotherapy. They have to be greater than a year of age. They have to have a diagnosis, whether it was cytology or biopsy of osteosarcoma. They have to have completed an acceptable chemotherapy protocol and be pretty healthy. And then they're eligible potentially for this vaccine. Um, to find out where they are, I can tell you that my facility is at it. And like I said, there's a little over 20 in the US and you can go to aratana.com and you can look for information about the different sites. I'm not sure if it's on their website or if you actually have to call the number on there. And so we also have the, so someone just said, my girl just completed three rounds of the vaccine a month ago. That is super fantastic. So I have a couple of patients going through it uh, right now. And so far, you know, it looks very exciting. The reason that we're super excited about this is in some of the studies that came out of Penn with Dr. Mason, dogs that had amputation plus chemotherapy plus the vaccine, their survival times were over 900 days, so well over two years, which is really, really exciting because, you know, we've kind of hit a wall with the combination of surgery or some other local disease and chemotherapy. So this is a um, USDA conditionally approved. Um, and basically what they need to do by this study, which is very regimented, is they're collecting the data and then it'll be reported to the government. And then if everything looks good and you know the safety has been shown and the, the results have been shown, then it will become fully licensed and then be available on a more regular basis. The other thing is in some of the sites, you have the option to, if you don't meet the study criteria, to potentially get a bit off study. So that information won't help us in terms of getting this licensed, which I think is super important that we do these studies so we can get these great therapies approved and then available to everybody who's interested in it. So it's pretty cool. Um, you know, the dogs can have flu-like symptoms afterwards. Um, and if you're interested in it, definitely go to the facility and get more information about it. But we have a good number of dogs entered in the study so far, and I've been pretty pleased with their results. And again, it would be something, if you're interested, to find one of those sites and talk to the oncologist more on a one-on-one -on -one, um conversation about your pet and whether or not they're eligible and, you know, just discuss the side effects and the cost and things like that. But again, super exciting that we even have this opportunity to talk about something. So again, guys, for osteosarcoma, you can treat it palliative. It may just be pain meds. It may just be palliative comfort-driven radiation, and it may just be osteosarcoma. Or you may want to go, you know, more aggressive and combine something, local therapy, whether it's surgery, radiation, stereotactic radiation, limb spare surgery combined with chemotherapy, and then also consider um, osteosarcoma vaccine, which hopefully if we get all these dogs, you know, get the study gets accrues enough dog and we can evaluate the data, it would be super fantastic if it was available, you know, if we can have more data about it to show its efficacy, uh, continue to show its safety, and then have more information about it. So again, really, really exciting information. Um, and then the tripods is posting some, you know, some dogs experiences with it and things like that. So there we go, guys. I know, I hope that was not an overwhelming amount of information. I'm just looking at some of the other questions that were sent in to make sure that we got everything and my 92,000 devices that we have here. Um, Jenny had asked about MLO. Um, I have a newly diagnosed patient and would love to benefit from positivity. Jenny, why don't we throw that question? Uh, it sounds like you're a veterinary professional. Guys, if you're a veterinary professional, meaning if you're a vet, a technician, practice manager, things like that, we have a closed Facebook group so where you can ask um, questions about that as well. So Jenny, 
Uh, hopefully we can get you in that group and we can post that there because I don't want you to have to wait for the next one and hopefully we can help you with that. So no offense, um, but again, that is where we discuss uh, cases and this is a site for everyone. So again, we have that closed group for veterinary professionals. Caitlin, if you want to throw that up there, we do double check, make sure that you're in the vet profession. Uh, so make sure your profile lists what you do. And if not, uh, we Facebook stalk you and try to make sure that you are. And then Doug had told me that his dog Cookie was just diagnosed and due for his third chemo. And then uh, Gail had asked about if you're not gonna do amputation and chemo because of the cost, which can definitely be an issue what is the best way? So I would definitely pain, 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 pain meds. That is one of the most important things that we can do for these dogs that uh, are not getting palliative radiation or amputation is make sure pain meds. And there was another question about pain meds as well. You know, a lot of these dogs will need multiple pain meds from different categories. So a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and then maybe something like tramadol in the opioid category, maybe something like gabapentin. Uh, Tylenol with codeine, but you need to be careful when you start adding these drugs together. So this is where you want to talk to your veterinarian and make sure that you know, you're know you adding the drugs at appropriate dosages and being careful with side effects. But again, a lot of these dogs will need multiple pain medications. Another cool pain medication not to forget both in the palliative sense is um, some of the bisphosphonates big word. Uh, the main one that we're using is Zomita, which is now not patented, so it's less expensive, which is great, which is also called Zolidronate, and that's a monthly injection, sort of similar to Phosphomax, which uh, is used in women with, I think, osteoporosis, but this is an injectable pain medication that can help really well with bone pain with osteosarcoma. So sometimes if I have owners that are deciding about amputation, we'll give that. Or if, you know, we didn't really talk about sometimes we see osteosarcoma in the face, the mandible, the lower jaw, the upper jaw, um, spinal bones and things like that. I've had some words of these bones near the eye and it's painful. That would be another one where we can add um, the zolidronate. The problem with Phosphomax, someone said, what about oral Phosphomax? The oral bioavailability, bell, bleh, done, I'm done guys. It doesn't get absorbed very well. So I do not recommend oral Phosphomax. We need to use one of the injectable ones. Before Zolidronate uh, the, was Pemidronate, but the studies in, in Illinois did a lot of the great studies on this. It didn't show that it really helped with bone pain uh, as well as Zolidronate. And there's some studies that suggest that Zolidronate might have some anti-cancer properties as well. One of the places that we're finding that useful is with dogs with palliative radiation as well. And then, Oh, there's also some studies at a pen where they gave the vaccine in dogs that had palliative radiation and they saw in potentially an extension of the dog survival time as well. So there might be some good uh, uses for the osteosarcoma vaccine in the palliative setting as well. So that is super, super exciting. Oh, all right. I made a cup of tea. I didn't even drink it. Cheers, guys. It's not wine this time, as far as you know. You can see tea. Uh, any other questions, guys? I guess not. Anyone still here? Yeah, there's a few people here. I'm not by myself. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, a couple of reminders. What am I supposed to remind you? So if you joined in late, in the beginning, I kind of gave my five-minute spiel on bone cancer. So if you came in late and you want to hear that, go back once the replay is up and listen to that. Guys, do me a favor. Please share this. If you have a friend who's going through this, you know, and you think that this information will be useful, tag them, share this. That would be super fantastic. If you haven't yet liked my page, please like it. That helps me. Remember to subscribe to the event. Say that you're going. Even if you don't come, you'll get a reminder about it as well. We all love reminders. And then my last and final plea is please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Again, all of these Q&As will be, appear there. So again, that's another great reference or resource for you or other people that are going through this. Guys, osteosarcoma is scary. Amputation is scary. I want to make it less scary. And I really, really hope that this was helpful. I appreciate your guys' time. It is a long day. I am going to go give my boys a kiss, hang out with my puppies. Um, if you have any questions, comments, please let me know. I appreciate the feedback, good and bad. And thank you so much for joining. So Caitlin, we have to find another day, but in the interim, we are going to stick with Wednesday, June 20th for cat skin masses. And, oh, don't forget the graphics are going to be coming out 
every couple of days, check them, share them, and you can find all of them. Once the last one is posted, they will be in an album so you can go back and look at them. Valerie, thank you very much. You are way too kind. Bruce, thank you so much. Say goodnight to your kids. Mine are both graduating from college tomorrow and Saturday. Ah, I know. I can't even believe it. My boys, I have two fabulous boys. Kale is 12 and Hudson is 10 and a half. So they keep me busy. The only other females in my house are Matilda, my eight, almost nine-year-old Labrador, and Penelope, my crazy one-year-old Lab. Uh, oh, one of the other things we didn't talk about. Guys, the next one we absolutely need to talk about um, neutering and spaying and osteosarcoma. So those will be things that we'll hit up. We'll talk about some supplements. Uh, we'll talk about the association with spay and neutering in dogs with osteosarcoma and whatever else you guys can think of. So guys, you're awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I had fun. Thank you for bearing with me with the technical difficulties. And we will see you on June 20th and try to find another day where we can do osteosarcoma part two. And maybe the next time I'm bringing wine. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.